Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Kościuszko Foundation's webinar, Dorota Masłowska's Provinces, with Professor Katarzyna Czeczow. My name is Eva Zadvorna. I'm Director of Cultural Affairs at the Foundation, and I want to thank you all for joining us here today. The webinar is part of a series presented in cooperation with the Institute of Literary Research of the Polish Academy of Sciences. The series features lectures on some of Poland's most notable writers. Today's talk is about the prose of Dorota Masłowska, whose literary debut, Snow White and Russian Red, became the overnight sensation and the biggest literary phenomenon in Poland. Four years after the successful debut at the age of 23, Masłowska shook the literary world again by receiving Nika, Poland's highest literary award, and edging out a Nobel Prize winning poet, Wisława Szymborska. About the phenomenon of Dorota Masłowska, whose writing has shocked, provoked, fueled controversy, and at the same time gained critical acclaim and many, many followers, we'll be speaking today Dr. Katarzyna Czeczot. Dr. Czeczot is a literature historian, associate professor at the Institute of Literary Studies of the Polish Academy of Sciences. Her research interest is primarily focused on gender studies and literature and visual culture from the French Revolution to the present times. She's the author and co-author of several publications, including books, articles, and reviews published in literary and cultural magazines. Katarzyna, thank you very much for accepting our invitation to uh, give this talk here today. And now the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And thank you for the invitation. And thank you for joining us. And now I'm going to share the screen to uh, this is the title of my presentation. I'm going to talk about Dorota uh, Masłowska. Dorota Masłowska is a novelist and playwright, and she was born on the 3rd of July 1983 in Bejarovo. And in 2002, as uh, already Eva said, she published the novel Wojna Polsko-Ruska pod flagą biało-czerwoną. There are actually two translations into English, but I'll get back to that later. But I'm giving to you these dates because as you can probably calculate, she was really young when she published that novel and it was really important in the reception of that book. And the novel won a Politica Passport Award. This is a very important award, the Sopo Złote Pióro, this is Golden Pen Award, and it got a nomination for the Nika Literary Award. It didn't win this uh, this award, but she, but Masłowska got uh, uh, the audience um, award. And so you can assume as that the book was really uh, became an object of many many discussions. And here you've got the cover of Przekru. This is a very popular magazine, Polish magazine. And um, I wanted to show you this cover because it's not really frequent to give the, uh, the writer's uh, face on the cover of the magazine. And especially when you add this kind of caption as we've got here. This is Sensacyjne debut 19 lat, sensational debut of a 19 year old with three exclamation marks. And the, and the sentence that I'll get back to uh, later, napisałam język dresierzy, it means that I wrote the language of a uh, track suited slackers. I think that would be the best, um, the best translations. But what is, the, what is really important, then you've got this, uh, then uh, you've got the, uh, the, the page from the, from the magazine, and you can see that Maswoska is, um, is compared to Francoise Sagan. And again, only the, only, the only link between her and Francoise Sagan is that they, both, they were both very, very young when they published their first novels. Francoise Sagan was, uh, was 18, Maslowska was 19. And as the, as the rumor says, uh, she wrote this novel preparing for a secondary school final, uh, final exams. Uh, this is, these are, uh, these are the ex excerpts from other Polish uh, weeklies and Polish papers. And again, I, I wanted to show them because I think that this is really unusual situation to give so much attention to the 
writer in Polish media, in Polish, I would say mainstream media, because they were often mainstream media. And um, here you um, there's a cover of uh, Polityka magazine. And apart from Maslowska, uh, there is uh, Anna Maria Jopek, who's a pop singer. So Maslowska was really quite often compared to uh, the celebrities of pop culture. And the, and the headline says, uh, the girl who shakes or moved the Polish culture. And Maswolska was supposed to shake the Polish culture in the, the way Manna Maria Jopek, uh, a pop singer, did. And here you've got again this uh, this caption that is a teenage teenage uh, teenage sensation literary sensation um, and uh, here Masłowska here I don't know if you can can you see the the, the yes we can the places where I show okay because here's there's a photo of Masłowska with uh, Grzegorz Torbicka who's a very famous TV um, TV presenter. And it's uh, during this uh, ceremony of Nike Award. Uh, but these are the positive, uh, the positive reactions to Maslowska book, and not all of them were positive, because uh, this um, caption sensation was um, uh, was very often. I mean, not it wasn't accompanied, but this caption sensation had this counterbalance in the in the slogan that it's a shame of Polish literature and um, and here uh, in here here these are all excerpts from uh, from Polish uh, papers and magazines weeklies where Maswoska is described as a product of uh, I don't know commercial campaigns and what is what is emphasized here of course again her youth um, but um, it's treated more like a commercial, commercial way of, uh, of selling her book, because her book, apart from those, um, from those literary awards, was, um, uh, was a bestseller. I think that, uh, that um, it, during first six months, there were 60,000 copies sold. It's a lot in, in Poland, there's really a lot. So it was a bestseller, but um, since it was a bestseller, Maswoska was accused of being a, I don't know, product of some commercial campaign. And, um, and here you, you've got the uh, Jarosław Klejnowski review, um, a passage from that. And it's important because this is a part of the bigger debate, which, um, uh, which was entitled uh, Revelation or Banality. That was the question that was uh, very often repeated when Maslowska's first novel was, uh, was discussed. Uh, then you've got the, then you've got the uh, review where Maslowska is claimed to be very imitative. And actually the author of this uh, review says that she is not original. She did that her novel is very imitative and uh, She's not a serious. She's not a serious author. Ah, oh, here you've got um, because this is this is important where her youth is uh, is considered. This caption, "Nie czytam więc pisze," which means um, I don't read, therefore I write, and it says that Maslowska is a immature girl uh, who shouldn't uh, write serious novels because serious novels cannot be. Uh, cannot be written by uh, by teenagers simply. And um, and Perły i Plewy of 2002. This is also very typical of the um, of the reception of her first novel because Maslowska novel very often appeared in so-called summaries of the of the year, where you where the um, the editors of the magazine wanted to show what was the most valuable in uh, Polish culture and what was the uh, the biggest failure. And Maslowska was very often uh, treated was very often qualified as the biggest uh, biggest hit as something as something really valuable, but. Um, but she was also often qualified as the biggest failure of the year 
uh, 2000, uh, 2002. And, um, a, and actually nobody, I mean, nobody, perhaps those critics who were, uh, who were favorable about her, uh, they did believe that Moskowska would write a second novel, but the, the, in those negative reviews, there's, um, there's a statement that she won't write a second, uh, a second novel. That it's, uh, it's, it's like the, it's, it's, uh, it's an accident, something that happened, but shouldn't have happened and won't happen again. Um, okay. Fortunately, she wrote a second novel, and here's uh, here's the list of her uh, of her works. There's uh, quite a lot. And what is important here is that in 2000, Eva has already said it, that in 2006, um, she won a Nike. Oh, sorry, this is a mistake. She won a Nike Award uh, for the novel uh, Povkrulove, and I. I think it's kind of significant because uh, all the writers who had got this uh, this award before Maslowska were very noble, old, very um, very famous. I would say very famous writers. I can give you some examples of people who got Nika Award uh, before Maslowska, and it was uh, Czesław Miłosz. Who got the Nobel Prize? Uh, oh, is this uh, uh, Stanisław Baranczak, Tadeusz Różewicz, um, Jarosław Marek uh, Remkiewicz, but also Wiesław uh, Myśliwski, Andrzej Stasiuk, Wojciech uh, Kuczok. There was only one woman before Maslowska who won a Nika Award, and it was uh, Joanna Olczek Roniker. So this, this uh, award functioned as a uh, as a kind of, um, I don't know, as a kind of, um, um, how to put it, um, as a kind of signature, signature signed under the under the diploma for a very very famous author, and suddenly uh, um, a writer who was twenty five at that time uh, won uh, won Nika Award, and. Her other works, um, her other works include um, playwrights, and these are dwoje biennych Romanów mówiących po polsku i między nami dobrze jest. Novels, as I said, and this is Kochania zabiłam nasze koty, Hania killed our cats, uh, and other people. But there are also uh, her short texts uh, written for weeklies and magazines. Uh, and these are uh, how to take the control of the world without leaving uh, leaving home. Very funny, very funny short uh, texts which are, can be treated as um, a sort of introductions into Polish contemporary culture. The Polish contemporary culture understood as very famous TV shows or very famous recipes, books, and things like that. Uh, okay, so you might say that her career was uh, much more serious than uh, the first reviewers of Napolsko Ruska uh, assumed. Uh, her uh, her first novel, the debut novel, has been translated, I think, that into twenty languages, into twenty European languages, and as far as I know, it is uh, now being translated into Chinese. Uh, so this is this is a kind of big success, especially that the language uh, that the language she creates is. I think it's not easy to uh, to translate. Her plays were staged not only by Polish theaters but also by other European theaters uh, like London and Barcelona and uh, Paris. Uh, one of the one of one of the one of the play theater played um, directed by uh, Grzegorz Jerzyna uh, has also been made into a movie. This is Między Nami Dobrze Jest, and this is a this is a poster of that movie. But uh, there was an also adaptation of her debut novel, Wojna Polsko-Ruska, and actually 
um, in this picture, you can see Dorota Masłowska herself, who took part, who actually, who actually appears in a novel, but uh, she also agreed to appear uh, to appear in the film. The film was uh, directed by Xaver Żuławski. I don't know if you if you know that director. Uh, uh, the film is kind of crazy, really, but the, the novel is also crazy. But and it was shot in two thousand and uh, two thousand and nine, um, and and recently she released an album. For chance was Miwa, the society is mean. Uh, this is the cover of that uh, of that album, and I strongly recommend you. I don't know. Um, I don't know if they're still funny in translations, but I strongly recommend you uh, Dorota Masłowska video clips that you can find on YouTube. Almost each song uh, from that uh, album has uh, its own video clip. Actually, this was the, the beginning of my presentation. This is a this is a, a still from uh, from a, one of her video clip. So. That would be that would be the summary of of uh, of her career. So not only she wrote the second novel, but she wrote many uh, many other books and became an important person for Polish theater, Polish cinema, and <laughs> Polish music. Um, but um, in this presentation, I want to focus only on her first novel. First of all, because I don't have much time. Uh, the second reason for that is um, is that, uh, as I already mentioned, this novel uh, raised so heated debate that actually I cannot imagine uh, I cannot imagine any other book that was uh, discussed by so many people at the same time. I mean, it was the number of reviews, but it was also the number of TV uh, programs. The Maswoska was everywhere actually. So this is a, that was, I would say that it was really important moment uh, in, um, in Polish uh, literature and the reception of her book. I think it's also an important moment in the history of, uh, of Polish literature. I think that what happened around, the, around Masłowska first novel can be treated as a kind of lens in which you can see a lot of lot of other processes that were kind of typical of that period uh, in in Polish literature. And the other reason I think that Wojna uh, Polska Ruska is worth uh, worth uh, dis still discussing is that this is a really important and very interesting image of uh, post-socialist uh, Poland of all cultural mental changes that uh, that took place in um, in the 90s but also at the beginning of um, of 2000 uh, so the, okay this is i think that i'm not quite sure because the uh, i i read uh, the translation i read is on only this white and red but there are two English versions uh, of the book. I mean, there's one translator, but there are two titles, as you can see. And, um, and the American title is Snow White and Russian Red. I think it's better, it's, uh, it's a better title. And, um, but there was also um, a British edition and uh, in British edition, Benjamin Palov, the translator gave the different title and it's white and red. And, um, uh, and this cover can be also interesting because you can. Now, I think that what they um, what they depict is the main character of that novel. This is Silne uh, in Polish and English. Uh, his nickname is Nails. And um, and the translator actually, because I I listened to the interview with him, explained it that. Um, Explained, uh, explained this nickname, uh, Nails, that he heard from his father that there's a expression strong as, no, tough, tough as nails. And that's why he decided to use nails as something that could be good equivalent of, uh, of Polish Um And I think that this character, which uh, is described as a track suited uh, slacker, uh, 
was one of the was one of the main reason uh, for which Maswoska was so I mean was so difficult to I mean couldn't be accepted by traditional critics because this is a this is a um, this is a character that probably some people think shouldn't be shouldn't appear in literature like at all and the novel is uh, his monologue so this is a very vulgar language uh, and actually this um, this vulgar language was uh, was the main thing that put off uh, most of the most of the critics. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so I want to focus on Masoska first novel, but first I want to say that it's not an easy task because because it was it's uh, the language of this novel is really something extraordinary and it's really difficult to talk about this novel in other language than Polish. And it's not something that I just invented, it was something that was emphasized by all the critics, by all the reviewers of that novel. And, um, and here I give you some examples. The first one is, uh, the first uh, quotation is taken from Justyna Soboleska's review. And uh, she writes about Maswoska language that it consists of sentimental phrases from soap operas and commercial, some today official expressions and remnants of the jargon typical of Polish uh, People's Republic. Maswoska managed to grasp, sorry, I cannot see my presentation. Okay, here is better. To grasp Polish linguistic clusters in which tradition and new accretion are mixed uh, together. Um, and here's uh, also the quotation from Marek Zaleski's review. Um, those both critics uh, really liked Maswoska novel, I should, I should ask here, because uh, when the critics didn't like novel, they actually, they, always, uh, they were always repeating this phrase about the vulgarity of this, uh, of this language. And um, in, Marek's, in Marek Zaleski's views, this trashy Polish attacked by cancer and at the same time, it hides reviving energy, linguistic constructions, sponge on lexical, grammatical and syntactic uh, norms. They damage them. This is very important. Maim them, overturn them, and corrupt. But diverting force of this language possesses energy of lumpen nihilist uh, carnival. And um, and actually, this uh, this language is something that um, it's it's uh, Benjamin Mapalov uh, himself who says that uh, Maswoska language is a huge uh, huge ch uh, challenge uh, for him as a as a translator and. Um, Oh. And I've got also the quotation from, uh, from him. Uh, and he says uh, the thing that uh, both Soboleska and Zaleski uh, have noticed uh, that Maswoska has this pre preternatural gift for hearing all kinds of language and then making them glue together in a single utterance. Um, so, uh, since the language of that novel is so difficult to grasp and uh, it's really difficult to talk about it, I decided to, uh, to start um, with the short analysis of the image because this is the, this is the uh, cover of the second edition of Masowska, of Masowska novel. And I find it, it's uh, designed by Maciej Sienczyk, this is uh, uh, an illustrator and a comic author. And I find it very significant. I think that Sienczyk managed to grasp many important things uh, that, um, that are, that are, that appear in Masowska, in Masowska uh, novel. Uh, he uh, his drawing transforms two images crucial for uh, Polish visual culture, and here you've got an um, allegory of Poland. And uh, this is, I think that it can, it can be easy. Uh, you can easily find an equivalent, like a concrete equivalent, in this here. And this is uh, this is allegory of uh, Poland as a woman trampled by a horse on which a Cossack. Uh, where the suburb sits. 
And, um, and I think that it refers to uh, Are Schaffer, uh, Are Schaffer paintings, which is entitled Allegory of November Uprising. It took part in 1831. Um, during uh, the partition of Poland. And the other image that uh, Sienczyk uses, this is the image of a nurse providing, uh, providing care for the, probably for the, uh, for the insurgent, uh, probably for, during the Warsaw Uprising. So this is a mixture of images that are really important for the um, uh, Polish martyrdom iconography. And um, this narrative, which is very, very important in Polish culture, could be summarized in, um, in a slogan that uh, would go 123, which are the years of Polish partition, plus six, which is uh, the number of years of, um, of German uh, occupations, plus 44, which is the period when uh, Poland was a, a satellite of Soviet, uh, satellite country of the uh, Soviet Union. So this is the narrative, this, uh, this cover refers to the narrative of uh, Poland as a victim, of Poland as a region dominated by, uh, by other empires. And, um, and this, um, this context is, in my opinion, is very important for, uh, for Maslowska novel. Of course, Maslowska novel is not a historical novel. Uh, this, um, this word that appears in a title, Wojna polsko ruska this is a fantasmatic uh, war. And uh, Ruskis uh, never appear in that book. There are only some, um, some effects of, uh, of the action. Uh, because the Ruskis are said to uh, have polluted Niemen. Uh, they, sorry, these are the quotation. They digged over the Polish industry, stole all the Polish scent. They produced false cigarettes. They produced false uh, cars. And um, all the characters in the book uh, have something to say about their very, very bad, uh, very bad actions. Um, so, and now I'm gonna stop. Uh, now I'm gonna uh, quote the beginning of the novel because the beginning of the novel I think is also important. Um, uh, is, is an important reference to all this martyrdom uh, context. Okay, so that's the beginning. This is a translation by Benjamin Palo. First she told me she had this is the first sentence of the novel. First, she told me she had good news and bad news, leaning across the bar. Which do I want first? The good news, I said. So she told me that in town, it looks like there's a Polish Ruski war under a white and red flag. I say, how do you know? She says she heard. So I say, then I'll take the bet. So she took out her lipstick and told me that Magda says it's over between me and her. Then she winks at the bartender like that. If something happens, she wants him to come over. We've got good news and, uh, and bad news. And, and you can see that um, this is the beginning of uh, both war narrative, war novel, and, uh, and the love story. And this is actually a good definition of Maslowska novel. I mean, the plot is not something, and the action is not something that is important about the novel. But if, you, if I were to summarize this novel, I would say that, yes, this is a story of, a, of, a, of the war and of uh, the love or actually the end, um, the end of love. And I think that this, this, um, uh, this um, excerpt, per ex, excerpt can, be, can, also, can be also referred to, the, uh, to Polish, uh, to some other contexts. So uh, here you've got good news and bad news. What, what are they? Good news, this is the beginning of a war. And this is a very important um, thing in, uh, in this Polish, um, in Polish history, in Polish, uh, in this Polish uh, slogan, which was 123 plus 44, plus six plus 44. Um, and what is, uh, and the bad news is the end of the love. And the traditional version of this narrative, um, this, is a, this is a story, uh, this is the story in which the female lover is replaced by the by the 
female Poland by Poland. I mean, Poland is Poland, as you can see, Poland uh, appears here as a, as a woman trampled by the horse. And this is a very important image in Polish culture. So Poland is very often depicted as uh, as female body uh, hurt by uh, by uh, by enemies. So when this uh, when this insurgent this is a this is a painting uh, by uh, by uh, Arthur Grodger and you, you've got the you've got the whole title here 1863 this is the next Polish uprising uh, farewell of an insurgent and you've got the textual equivalent here uh, which says this is a this is I would say that this is a topos or a very important motive that the insurgent says goodbye my girl now uh, I have to choose other woman and this other woman this is Poland so um, so that would be the traditional version actually this is this is a, this is perhaps an interesting thing that this uh, this song which is goodbye my lover, uh, my patria, let's say patria, because when you've got the fatherland, the gender here is disturbed, my patria is calling. This is, um, this is the song that was also used uh, during, the, during the strikes at the Lenin shipyard in Gdańsk. Uh, so it has a long tradition from the November uprising in 1831 to strikes in 1980. And it's it's uh, its message is always this, is always the same. Goodbye, my woman. Stay at home. I have to now. I have to take care uh, of the fatherland. Now I have to devote to the um, to my patriotic duties. And now I'm gonna have other lover, which is Poland. And of course, in Maslowska's version, this uh, this traditional narrative is somehow disturbed. I mean, she. Uh, she refers to this narrative, but she um, she somehow overturns it because it's not uh, she, the main character, who leaves her lover. It's the lover, the female lover, who decided to leave him. And I think it has um, it has some uh, uh, some consequences, but I'll get to it. Uh, I'll get to them. Uh, I'll get to them later. And now I want to show you. Uh, the image of the enemy. As I told you, Ruskis, but I'm gonna say Ruski because I think Ruskis actually, yes, this, uh, this word is not official and it's uh, like a very general enemy from the East. I mean, it's not a uh, synonym of Russian and it's, uh, it's, it refers to, um, to all the things that are, uh, that are going on in, uh, in the East of Poland. So now I want to focus on this uh, on this imaginary enemy, which are Ruskis in Nova, in uh, Masoska Nova, because this is like a surrealist vision what is going on. So then she asks me whether I know that in our lands there is a Polish Ruski war with a white and red flag which waves between the native Poles and the Ruskis of the East, who rob them of custom duties of nicotine. I tell her I don't know anything about it. To that she says, it's exactly how things are. It's what she hears, that the Ruskis want to cheat the Poles out of this place and establish a Ruski government here, maybe even a Belaruski one, that they want to shut down the schools, the government offices to kill the Polish newborns in the hospital in order to eliminate them from society, to impose protection fees and tribute for the industrial and grocery products. I said that they're common swine, common informants. So these are, this, is the, this is the image of, uh, of Ruski. Uh, they are accused of absolutely everything. I mean, even at, uh, at some point, uh, the main character says that death doesn't exist, that this is, uh, this is something that Ruski invented to, um, to, um, to, to, uh, to, to make us feel afraid, to, make, to, give, to give us uh, this uh, existential fear. But what is important here, because the title says that it's about the war between Poles and Ruskis, but what is important here, I think it's extremely important, is that it's not the only enemy. I mean, it, what the other enemy that appears in Masoska novel, this is also very generally understood, the West. And here you've got the quotation, what, um, 
uh, what the main character uh, thinks uh, of Wes, or rather what is he, what, what he's afraid of. I remember my thought of a truly economic character that could save the country from the very annihilation I mentioned earlier. And annihilation prepared for the country by the fucking aristocrats dressed in overcoats and aprons who, if only the conditions were right, could sell us the citizens to horses in the West to the German army for workers for slave labor, who finally want to sell our country out like some old secondhand crap, a bunch of wrecks and ancient coat labeled Minsk, Mazowiecki, sweaty old bells, if you pardon my saying, because the way I look at it, the only way is to drive them out of their homes to drive them out from the apartment blocks and to turn our fatherland into a typical agricultural fatherland that produces, even if only for exports, normal Polish sand that would have a chance on the global markets in all of Europe. So what is what is West accused of is this desire to buy Poland. And what is uh, what the main character is afraid of is that uh, that everything in Poland would soon belong to some Western countries that are not precise, precisely named. Um, okay, this is, a, this is a still from the movie by Xaver, Xaver Żuławski, and there's a main character, Nails, here in the, uh, in the middle. Uh, because what is, what is important here is, of course, Ruskis, um, exi Ruskis appears in the novel as a, as a threat and uh, perhaps it's a serious threat as an empire. Uh, and, uh, but also Ruski function here as something really despised. Um, soon, I'll, soon I'll give you the, the quotation. So this, 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 this is ambivalence, there are threats I mean, Ruskis, this is a, this is a strength, strength that uh, somehow threats Polish independence. But at the same time, they are, uh, they are diminished, they are despised, there's something uh, that uh, should be mocked, at, etc. They are worse, they are worse, they are imitative, they uh, produce those uh, false cars, false cigarettes and false uh, cities, and they are definitely inferior uh, to, to the West. While West is at the same time, uh, when it is presented as something, as a, as a threat to Polish independence, at the same time, West is something that, uh, that Poles aspire to. Uh, so again, we've got this ambivalence here in this, in this image that uh, we should be afraid of West, but at the same time, we want to be as the Westerners. This is, uh, this, is very, uh, this is very important. Why is it important? Because as you can see, Maswoska refers to this uh, martyrdom uh, narrative that can be summarized again, 100, 2000, uh, 123 of uh, Polish patrician plus, uh, six uh, years of occupation and plus 44 years of uh, Soviet, sometimes called occupation. Anyway, that she refers to this martyrdom, uh, martyrdom uh, narrative, but at the same time, she, uh, she adds some new element, which is really important here. And this is the position of Poland in a uh, global market. This is th the, the next level of this uh, narrative of this war with imaginary, imaginary uh, enemies. Because Ruskis are responsible for counterfeits. What they do, they, these are cheap imitations. And, um, and uh, in this context, they are associated with women. This is, uh, this is also important. And here's the, here's the image of Arletta. This is also the still from the film. Arletta is this girl who gave uh, nice this uh, bad news and, get, and uh, good news and bad news. And here, uh, there's a description of Aleta leaning over the bar like some sales girl over the counter, like she wanted to sell me some crap, some chocolate, cho chocolate tea product, chocolate podobne for uh, Polish speakers. Aleta, rusty water in her beer glass, Easter egg dye. The candy she'd sell would be empty in the middle, all foil. So it's pazwotko, no, not foil, but pazwotko, which is really important, but probably impossible to translate which she wouldn't touch with her own fingers, the nice bootleg and false, since she herself is false, empty inside, smokes her six, bought from Ruskis, false bubbles, 
instead of nicotine, there's some garbage in there, some unfamiliar drugs. Some papers show the stuff that teachers wouldn't dream of. This, uh, References to Shakespeare, Mitzkevich, Voyacek are very, uh, is also something typical of Masoskapros. So some papers, uh, stuff that teachers wouldn't dream of, stuff that police wouldn't dream of. So, so Ruskis, yes, they are associated with a counterfeit and uh, with fakes, uh, fake projects and uh, products and cheap uh, imitations. And now the, now the West, this is, uh, this is also the still from the, from the movie, uh, and uh, and this is this is the girl who reads Philippine because it's Magda, and she low she she reads uh, Philippine because it's low energy. Sorry, there's one more mistake here. I'm leaving, she says. I'm leaving. I'm leaving this place to go somewhere else to better states. The lecture passed. Uh, I say like where to which she says to like warm countries she says she'll go to those countries where they have those outfits these cosmetics creams made of cucumbers from everything because that's that's the only place she wants to live if i want to be with her just under the eyes various creams bath salts i said that yes i want to though on this point my understanding is otherwise i'd say more left is patriotic so this is this west west the girls, because these are usually women, aspire to. They want to leave Poland. And this is really important because this is, um, now we can see um, the way Maswoska transformed this motive. I mean, in traditional Polish narrative, the story goes, uh, goes as following. Goodbye, my lover, my lover. Uh, the patria is calling me. And in Maswoska's, in Maswoska's version, that would be goodbye, Shilne, goodbye, Nes. This is the, the, the name of the name character. But the, the West is calling me, yes? So it's, it's, um, it's something completely different and it's very, very significant uh, transformation of, that, uh, of this traditional uh, motive. And um, this, uh, this position of Poland between East and West, which is a very important thing in uh, in Maswoska in Maswoska uh, Maswoska novel, was the reason for which some of some critics um, applied uh, post-colonial uh, theory to uh, to that novel, and one of the one of the excellent uh, applications uh, of that theory to Maswoska novel is uh, Claudia Sonkowska Gonzalez's book. Is freedom and and writing, and you can find the uh, English chapter uh, of that book uh, on Academia. Uh, uh, it's easy to uh, to find. Um, of course, there are many many controversial controversies, and now uh, we don't have so much time to consider all those all those discussions uh, that took place whether postcolonial theory which is the way to deal with cultural legacies of uh, colonialism and imperialism to uh, whether this post-colonial theory can be applied to the situation of uh, countries like Poland. Um, but uh, how, how Claudia, how, how Claudia Snohoska Gonzalez uh, sees that, how she interprets Maswoska novel in, uh, in this context. This picture of the location between the East and the West is a reflection produced at absurdum of the Polish post-colonial syndrome, a combination of the sense of superiority over Russia, which is subjected to oriental, orientalization, to become a symbol of the most despised, with a sense of inferiority to genuine Western Europe, committed yet demonized as a power striving to imperially dominate Poland. Modern capitalism presenting itself as the only way is the essence of the desired Western life and what the unwanted, shameful and prosecuted Ruskiness lacks. Commodification of reality accompanies both the willingness to succumb to it and resistance uh, against it. Um, 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 so, okay, I think it's kind of important and I try to try to explain um, this in the most uh, simple way as I, as I can. Post-colonial theory in, um, in this version, I mean, Snohovska-Gonzalez version, 
does not refer to all those martyrdom narratives because it's sometimes uh, those narratives, post-colonial theory and martyrdom narratives sometimes um, meet together, sometimes uh, meet. But what is more important uh, for Claudia is not those years of, um, of uh, foreign domination, it's more like the position of Poland uh, in global markets. It's, it's, it's more about its relation to the West than those years of uh, partitions and uh, years of uh, being a satellite country of Soviet Union. The, the context of capitalism is something that, uh, that is crucial in, um, in this, uh, in this uh, version of uh, application post-colonial theory to Polish situation. Um, okay, I uh, I would say that uh, that something that uh, that I would I mean I would join with post-colonial theory and Maslowska novel would be a figure of the counterfeit, because as I already said, uh, counterfeit appears as something associated with Ruskis, and it's a proof that Ruskis are inferior because they don't have this beautiful original uh, Western products. And here you've got the quotation from a Soska book. Uh, the, the main, uh, the main, Schillner's house have, um, uh, has, has this siding. And uh, when he looks at the side, he, he said, it's newly installed, elegant, white, a Western look, though it's bought from the Ruskis. So Poles in this novel use uh, Ruskis counterfeits to pretend or to look as if they were uh, Westerners. At the same time, but this is a, this is a, um, perhaps a digression. Uh, Ruski's counterfeits include um, white and red flag. So this is a, this is the fake flag which um, which enable Poles to be real patriots or something. Um, okay, this um, this uh, counterfeit uh, seem important to me. Because it's uh, it's really something that uh, tells about um, the position of Poland after the transition in, uh, cap in, in uh, to capitalism, because um, counterfeits is something that appeared in Polish marketplace in the late uh, 80s, and it was Poland was full of them in um, in the 90s. And here you've got the very famous uh, brand Abibas. Uh, which was sold in uh, in Polish marketplace, but what is important here is that Poles at the beginning didn't. I mean, either they didn't see a difference or they didn't care about it. I mean, the logic was like that: Why should I buy Adidas and uh, pay a lot of money while I can have Abibas? They look exactly the same and they cost much less. And at the same time, there was a I don't know. We can call it a press campaign because there was some. Uh, some necessity of uh, creating serious Western middle class in Poland. So Poles were schooled in the necessity of always choosing the branded commodity over its cheaper cousin. And this, uh, this campaign, this press campaign is, uh, is an object of analysis, um, of analysis in uh, uh, Magda Szczesniak's book, which is uh, entitled The Norms of Visibility, Identity in a Time of Change. The counterfeit is uh, is, um, uh, is something that she, she, she devotes a, a separate chapter. And, um, and since Poles didn't want to, I mean, for the very long time, they didn't want to choose the branded commodity over its cheaper cousin, uh, the counterfeit functioned as a symbol of unsuccessful uh, transition. And um, once it was the symbol of unsuccessful transition, this press campaign and the schooling uh, made uh, the counterfeit one of the categories used to produce class differentiation. I mean, if you had uh, Adidas, it meant that you were from the middle class. If you had Abibas, it meant that you can only aspire to the Western look, but now it's not for you. Um, so, I okay, I think that... Uh, I don't have much. Uh, I don't have much time. But what I wanted to say is that because that's uh, that's the only that's the only way I can 
uh, I can try here to grasp um, something which is very uh, typical of Masłowska language. Because I what I think is that this language has this logic of the counterfeit. I mean, I don't know how many of her uh, speak Polish here, but this is uh, these are the typical things that she that she does uh, in her book. That she get she she takes one collocation, she broke she breaks this collocation, and replaces one of its uh, one of its element with a synonym of it. So it sounds strange. I mean, you get wiedzieć prawda instead of znać prawda. So visits and snacks, these are no, uh, it's the, only, the English equivalent is, is uh, one, it's no, the truth. So it sounds weird, it sounds incorrect, uh, but it's still, it's, uh, it can, the meaning of it can be easily, easily grasped. The other, the other strategy that she applies is, um, is a kind of excess of, uh, of language that she, uh, that she adds uh, the words that are very similar, or these are simply pleonasms, and um, that you have this impression that there are more words than you need. Um, but this creates um, this creates um, this creates a feeling of a very professional or expert language, a very professional or official language. And uh, yeah, you'll get this which is a uh, very artificial expression because people would, uh, would say it uh, in, a, in an easier way. And I can now I can go back to, because this is also a quotation from uh, Magda Szczęśniak, because she, uh, what she does is that she formulates the thesis that perhaps we should think about those counterfeits as a alternative practices toward commodity capitalism. That, uh, uh, okay, I'm not going to read the, um, the who, okay, that, uh, that, this, uh, this heated, that this heated debate was necessary for maintaining the domination of Western capitalism, which is obvious. And, but simultaneously, the possibility of an Eastern fake successfully passing as a Western commodity destabilized, and I think it's very important, destabilized these seemingly obvious and natural categories, the basic tenets of contemporary consumer practices in global capitalism. If the counterfeits seem to be asking us, we look so much like the real thing, then what is that makes the original worth a small fortune? What makes Pumas better than, uh, better than Umas? And I think that it would be, the, it's something that uh, could be applied to uh, Maslowska language. Okay, I think that uh, uh, I have enough time. Okay, this is a, this is a still because um, this is also, uh, I just want to make a summary of this uh, post-colonial uh, application. Maslowska also appears in, uh, in the novel. She appears and um, as a, as a woman working in a, a police uh, police office, and um, and the main character is really scared of kind of scared of her when she sees her for the very first time because he thinks that uh, she resembles some sister, some his sister that doesn't exist, and that's um, a very strange creature. Anyway, uh, this is again the quotation from uh, from Claudia Snachowska Gonzalez's book, uh, because Cla Snachowska Gonzalez thinks that this is very important that Maslowska enters this book because that um, that is something that uh, that prevents uh, the reader from looking at Silne as a kind of subaltern kind of uh, exotic folk living in a strange country and it prevents the readers from this easy reaction of, uh, I don't know, despise and mockery. And what's, that's what she, she writes. By entering the novel, Dorota Maslowska decides against capitalizing on Nails the subaltern. It is not her intention to take over his power either by means of irony, indignation, or condescending fraternization. She aims at the very category of subordination because this is the only way for her to act for the benefit of the subordinate. She ceases to speak through knives and exposes to her. And um, 
and she here Claude here uh, Snowska Gonzalez refers to one of the main uh, figure in postcolonial theory, uh, Getras Pivak, who when she was to define her attitude to subaltern and in colonized colonized subject, she said that what is important is um, to confront them is not to represent them, but to learn to represent ourselves. Uh, so what is important here is that Maswalska appearing as a novel, as a additional character, refuses to represent Shilne. She does something more and, uh, and uh, she simply, she simply decides to give away her, her privilege, her privilege, uh, her privilege of uh, representing him. This is a very funny, uh, this is a very funny um, fragment from this, uh, from this book, because Nails uh, starts to talk to Maswoska. She's writing, she's, her, her surname is written like that with a, with a mistake in it. And he starts to examine her. I mean, she decides, he decides, or he decides to test uh, her uh, ability to comprehend the text. So, and this is very funny, I'm gonna read a lot. Pay attention, and it's on the, uh, like the end. Pay attention, because the trick question. Socio-political background is the Polish Ruski word just a documented historical fact or a set of occasional prejudices. How does that collective hallucination evolve with respect to wars with the imagined enemy? Sketch out an appropriate diagram of the function. Is what you're holding merely a common pain Explain the concept aloud, phallic symbol. What kind of significance obtains in its description provide an oral explanation for the term? Capitalism, advertising, joint stock company. At the local disco, it means Saturn. What do you, what do you say? React spontaneously to the same situation. And now you stamped Maswaska. Now it's already an advanced course. And instead of answering, you're staring at the radar. Maybe they've turned out your tongue, your tongue at last. So that's what Nails says to Maswoska, Maswoska, the character uh, of the book, but Maswoska, who's an uh, alter, when I say that she, she is an alter ego of the, of the, of the writer. And Snohowska Gonzalez thinks that this is really, really crucial, that this is really important about uh, Maswoska book, and that that is exactly this uh, thing that makes her book um, unusual, unusual and uh, exceptional. And that's again of uh, again quotation from uh, Claudia. This way we go beyond the repertoire anticipated by Spivak. As I told you, Spivak made this distinction between uh, uh, representing subaltern and uh, learning them to represent themselves. Uh, the subaltern ceases to be subaltern when the author dares, sh dares share her privilege with him. That's what Maswoska does with, uh, with Nail. This is how the confrontation between Nails and Maswoska, in other words, exposing the process of representation, leads to the emancipation of both protagonists of uh, Snow White. And what is this, eman uh, what is this emancipation? Um, this emancipation of Nails consists in his refusal to be represented. And now the quotation from the novel uh, also one of my favorite ones. And maybe some other way, maybe what's lying here in the bed is just my representative for Poland. Maybe it's only my demo tape. That's what, uh, that's what Nails uh, says, and it's almost the, the end of uh, the end of novel. So it is, it is, uh, it is the image of post-colonial uh, Poland. It is the image of colonized uh, subjects, and Nails is uh, definitely one of them, it's how Maswoska uh, presents him. But at the same time, while when she enters uh, her novel, she does this unusual thing. Um, she, uh, she shares her privilege with a colonized, with a colonized subject. And that thing that Ness says to her that uh, maybe what's lying here in the bed is just my representative for Poland. This is the uh, this is his refusal to be represented, and I think that this is um, a very important point of that uh, of that novel. Thank you.
I already yes, stopped sharing. Katarzyna, thank you very, very much for this very insightful and very informative and very extremely pre interesting presentation. Uh, what I'm thinking by the first thought is that I really start regretting narrowing your presentation to just one an hour <laughs> because there were like so many interesting themes that you mentioned. So uh, we have a question from the anonymous attendee. Illustracje w polskiej i angielskiej wersji są te same. So whether the illustrations in both Polish and English versions are the same. I've got only, I've got only this British edition and there are no illustrations inside. Uh, but um, but I think there's only one edition, one Polish uh, edition of Wojna Polska Ruska with illustrations by my sister. They're really funny. I mean, they're uh, they're really funny. Uh, but I think that's the only edition. The second edition of uh, Wojna Polska Ruska Polish edition contains um, illustrations because uh, I think that. Um, and I don't know. I don't know what uh, what the American version uh, looks like. I mean, I've, I've got only white and red. Ah, okay. So you're ready. No. I'm, I'm ready. But Marty Shanchek, Marty Shanchek is an illustrator that I recommend totally. Uh, yeah. In Maslowski book and uh, in all other um, uh, all other aspects because he he's uh, he's really funny and uh, there's something that. Uh, his illustrations express that uh, the text would never do. Mm -hmm. uh, just also out of curiosity, do you know the reason why, why there are different uh, titles in translations, British and American? Is there, because it's by the same translator, it was published, but translations were, were published in the same year, 2005. So why? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, I, 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 no, honestly, I didn't even uh, try to find out because I simply assumed that that must be some, uh, I don't know, some strategy of publishing houses. Uh -huh. oh, okay. Uh, so that was a big even not the author's decision, but uh, publishing houses imagined the, you know, the most catchy uh, title that would make the book um, popular and uh, sold well. The question is to what extent does Mat Maslowska's work reflect the cultural and moral changes in the post-transition Poland? I How much is it, there the uh, depiction of life of this, you know, young generation? And okay, actually, th these were the two strategies of dealing with that book by when when we talk about the like the initial reception because some people claim that yes we've got the realist novel and yes now we've got the reflection of um, of the society and especially of uh, this generation living in small towns and as you said deprived of all chance possibilities and etc cetera, etc cetera. poor jobless uh, uneducated etc and i think that uh, this is the this this um, this strategy of uh, of reading maswoska is not the best one but at the same time i say that Yes, she does reflect very important uh, changes uh, in Poland. But I would say, I mean, I liked what Maswoska told. Uh, it was a it was a brilliant panel discussion that took place during one of the Polish literary festival, and it was a meeting of um, translation Maswoska translation translators into English, Russian, Spanish, and German. And uh, they, they were talking about the uh, difficulties with uh, with this uh, with those translations. Anyway, Maswoska during this meeting she said that she um, that she moved the language that she that she simply I don't know press the buttons and the language goes itself. I mean it develops itself and it goes crazy. It goes to the directions that are really really crazy. But at the same time, it cannot be said that it's just a game. That is just an innocent play. That's a that's, uh, you know, linguistic plays, linguistic games, and uh, that's that's the thing. because in this crazy language that uh, as I, as I as I try to show, this is so broken, contaminated, corrupted, uh, a very very strange uh, thing that this language somehow conceals, and this is Maswoska's own words, uh, national unconscious. 
that, uh, that these are these obsessions, these complexes, inferiority complexes towards the West and superiority complexes towards the, the East. And all those uh, complicated uh, feelings and, uh, and mentalities that are connected to, uh, to, to Poly, to the position of Poland in Europe, to its history and, uh, and to its culture. So, in this way, yes, it does reflect. But this is this is this um, uh, this uh, folly of the language that reflects uh, Polish mentality. Not the not this um, level uh, illustrating uh, the characters, the houses, the I don't know rituals, habits, etc. Yeah, yeah, it probably is. I mean, it has a lot of to do, and I like reading those uh, those uh, passages that describe. Um, uh, houses interiors, because you got Matka Boska z Lichenia, Obraz ze Skóry, and a lot of lot of objects that you can uh, that you can that you somehow know from your uh, from the houses that you've been to, but I don't think that's that's that this is this valuable uh, reflection that uh, it's more like this uh, this folly of the language. Speaking about the language, uh, well, we have to agree that there is hardly any literary language used in Raskowska's <laughs> uh, prose. Um, I mean, her debut novel consists of much yeah, slang, many vulgar words. Um, is there, like, are, are there any, any precursors of this sort of technique style aiming to? <laughs> Uh, that I think that uh, that her language is absolutely unique. And actually, I can can I can I share one more thing because um, I I I promised that I um, that I would go back to that, but I didn't. But this is a very this is a very significant meaningful expression. I mean, this uh, this cover of uh, Przekro magazine when she says napisałam język dresiarza. Because uh, it's not that I used tracks so that's like a language. Okay, sure. that I read this, uh, that I wrote this novel with this and that kind of language. It's more like, like I wrote the language. I mean, I created it. And this is very important because it's not, uh, it's not something that, uh, that you can hear uh, in everyday life. It's something, it's, it's, it's something completely, completely different. And I think it's unique. What is more, I think that she creates um, a kind of separate kind of language for each of her texts, for each of her novel, because uh, um, other people, this is like crazy hip hop song or something like that. It's totally different. Pav Krulova is more like a modernist. Uh, I mean, this is a, this is a travestation of modernist uh, poetic language. So they create, so each time she creates a new kind of language. But I would say that she does have a precursor uh, as far as uh, as far as her uh, as far as her uh, attitude to Polish tradition is concerned, and that would be Gombrowicz. This is a very this is a this is I think that this is a combination that has um, that has appeared in some some of the some of the reviews, but also in some academic analysis. But uh, now I can refer to the things that, uh, that I said during the lecture. But when you get this motive of the parallel to the insurgent, I don't know, uh, I don't know who of you read uh, tra uh, Transatlantic by Komprovich, but it's, it, this, is, this is the same uh, transformation. I mean, Komprovich's, Komprovich's novel, starts uh, with uh, the main character, I mean, the narrator of the, of the book says, I'm not, okay, I'm on the ship that is going to Argentina. Um, the war, the Second World War has just broke up and uh, probably all my friends expect me to go back to Poland and fight for my, uh, for my country, but I'm not gonna do that. And this is the decision that is the, this is the initial decision that, um, that fuels the, the narrative of, uh, of that novel. And this is very important because what happens to this narrator in Argentina, these are some homoerotic, homosexuals, homosexual stories. I mean, 
while he refuses to say goodbye to his male, to his female lover and go fight for the country. He does something the opposite. He somehow, do you know what I mean? Overturns this uh, patriotic heterosexual narrative because he says, what he says, far away, far away my country and um, welcome, welcome my, my lover, my male lover. So this is, you know what I mean? This is something very similar that Masłowska does that he, takes something that is, I don't know, this is something uh, something really important. This is the foundation of uh, Polish imagination. It's really, really important. As I, as I told you, this song appeared during the strikes uh, at, the po at, the, at the shipyard in Gdansk in the, in the 80s. So it was, um, it's not a thing that is connected to the 19th century and it's that it's over. No, this is something that creates uh, our reality and that is an important element of our uh, our imagination. So I think that the way they uh, the way they they um, deal with the Polish tradition uh, is uh, is similar. I mean, that's that's the moment where Maswoska resembles Gombrowicz. Her language is something completely unique. Uh, it's the same can be can be said about Gombrowicz's language because in Transatlantic he creates something like baroque, uh, crazy constructions, but it's all about uh, it's and it, it somehow refers to Gawenda Szlacherska. Anyway, it's a, it's a, it's his unique language but he works on the same material and he has the same uh, desire to, to break the rules, to break the rules of a dominant Polish uh, narrative of this patriotic martyrdom, uh, martyrdom narrative, which is very, which, uh, which, which makes, uh, makes us suffocate. I mean, it's, it's, not, uh, it's, it's not something that opens uh, possibilities. It's something that closes the possibilities. Were there also many followers among the Polish writers? I mean, writers who would try to copy <laughs> the way how she yeah. writes it. Uh, one, of the, um, one of the Polish novelists, I think that she's, uh, she's Masłowska age, Agnieszka Drutkiewicz. Uh -huh. She even said in one of the interviews that now it's um, it's trendy to talk with Maswa. That now it's uh, because I, I I showed you this is that was very actually that was very narrowing. Uh, I mean the, the tricks, the linguistic tricks that I showed you during the presentation. This is something like uh, very little, uh, it says very little of all the amazing things that she does with the language, but these are the tricks that can be easily uh, imitated. And there was a, yes, there was a, it was trendy to, to speak the language like this with all this excess, with all these broken collocations, uh, with all those uh, repetitions and things like that, with this rhythm, this rhythm is, uh, it's not easy to imitate, but also, but also people try to do it. So she was imitated even in everyday language. And yes, yes, there were um, there were uh, writers who 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 tried to imitate them. What what is your favorite book by Maslowska that you would? Well, my favorite my favorite book is the book that hasn't been translated into English. That's the second novel. This is Queen's Peacock. Peacock, but uh, I think that uh, now we, because. Uh, Probably you know that um, website culture.pl. This is culture PL smaller. This is about uh, this. Is, we've got some English articles on Polish culture over there. And now I I, I noticed that they use the title um, the Queen Spew 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 yes. S uh, S P E W. Mm -hmm. So because it's more, yeah it's um, uh, peacock is not the peacock in Polish is also means uh, uh -huh. to throw up. Anyway, I think it's marvelous because uh, this is a this is a the language of the novel is marvelous, and I think that um, what she does there with the figure of a female author, because this is the novel that deals with the reception of her first novel when she was treated as a puppet mascot in media's hands, and I think that uh, the, the reaction actually that the reaction to Maslowska's first novel were very patriarchal and that they were very misogynic because uh, 
there was uh, a lot of things that ha that have been said was um, was connected to female stereotypes, stereotypes of uh, female literature, female culture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So when she when she when she wrote her second novel, this is uh, she creates this um, this figure and she she does some marvelous uh, thing and she somehow tells a lot of uh, unobvious uh, things about culture in the market. I mean, about all those, um, all those ambivalences uh, uh, of uh, culture. Actually, I think that actually the reception to Masoska first novel was also something that tells us a lot about this new, new phase uh, of, uh, in the history of Polish literature, that this is the literature in the market and it's something, it's something that shocked a lot of people. That there are some, you know, some things that are more connected to the market than to the literature. And there were these, these things were kind of new, I mean, uh, in, in Polish culture. So, so uh, Paw Królowe is the answer to all those, all that debate over Wojna Polsko-Ruska. And I think that it's a uh, yeah, it's a brilliant answer. So that's, that's uh, but I cannot recommend it to you because it hasn't been translated to okay. uh, to English. Ah, oh, wonderful work. And this makes a reference to the play. Uh, the original title means nami is dobrze. Means nami dobrze jest. Um, uh, that play seems to some critics more in line with patriotic patriotic view. Was she trying to distance herself herself from left leftist appropriations? Uh, I I missed it. No, no. I mean, the it was on the list of her. At least it was on the list of her um, of her of her works. That's uh, that's uh, definitely. You think that it's in line with the patriotic view? No, I don't. No, I don't think so. It's. Um, uh, okay, okay. I, I guess now I, I guess I know what you mean. But uh, that it says the story of of, um, of very poor people, excluded, and etc. But I think that um, that it's not this patriotic view um, understood as um, I don't know as uh, this. Um, nationalist narrative about Polish martyrdom, etc. I think it's more about it's 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 about um, it's the story that shows us some people excluded, but they are excluded economically, culturally. So this is the this is a story of some of a, this. I would say that this is an image of some uh, some class. That this is an image of a family, but of a, but also of the class of certain people. Who live in their dreams only about the better world that are promised in, uh, on TV and uh, in the magazines, but the world that uh, has to remain unavailable to them because of their because of their position, which is uh, which is this exclusion. So no, I don't think it's a patriotic. I mean, definition of patriotic can be very different. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. I uh, don't see any further questions from our attendees, so I believe that, uh, well, it's been an hour and a half, it will be the time to, to conclude uh, this, this webinar. Um, thank you and thank you to all our attendees uh, who joined us. As With respect to all our previous webinars, this webinar also was recorded and we will post it on our YouTube channel and the Foundation's website. So if you would like to watch it again, <laughs> well, the video uh, will soon be posted. In the meantime, thank, thank you. you. Thank Have you very much.